Today we are discussing one of the biggest one-hit wonders to go viral before going viral was a thing. The great sage and icon to stoners everywhere, after Bob Marley, a certain Mr. Foreman, better recognized by his stage name, Afroman. After dropping an iconic single, Afroman rose to fame literally overnight after years of dedication and landed an amazing six album deal with Universal. At this point in time, it seemed like he was destined to drop hit after hit, but this wasn't the case. After a while, Afroman quickly faded away from the spotlight. So the question is, what happened to Afroman? What up guys, Ali here and welcome to Ali Talks Music. Add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music as well. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Now let's get into the video. Afroman was born around 1974. He was raised in East Palmdale and felt a close kinship to music from a young age, playing guitar and drums at his church in his youth, citing influences such as Big Daddy Kane, Too Short, and Two Live Crew. Afroman's career started all the way back in the eighth grade when he wrote a song about a teacher that kicked him out of class for sagging his pants a big deal at the time and a punishable offense. He turned the situation into a profitable one for himself and discovered his gift along the way. The first tape I made was about my 8th grade teacher. She got me kicked out of school for sagging my pants which was a big deal back then. So I wrote this song about her and it sold about 400 copies. It was selling to teachers, students, just about everybody. And I realized that even though I wasn't at school, my song was at school, so I was still there. All these people would come by my house just to give me comments about how cool they thought the song was. Soon after this, Afroman began his pursuit of his career, continuing to write rhymes about his hard knock life and all the extras that go with it. Along the way, he attended college, which is where, humorously, he earned his rap moniker. Displaying both his entrepreneurial skill and sense of humor, he named himself after something he was being teased for daily. I got named Afro Man on the street. Back in the mid 90s, Afro was out. All black dudes that had something on the ball had a haircut. Michael Jordan, Tupac Shakur, even Martin Lawrence. I couldn't afford to go to the barber shop every other day, so I didn't have a big, beautiful, voluptuous Afro. I had that little irritating situation. This girl started calling me Afroman in college and everyone thought that shit was funny. So they started calling me that. I couldn't get away from it. So I said, okay, my name is Afroman. I started making t-shirts and I tried to make it as creative as possible, putting my head in the O and it worked. Everybody that was laughing at me was buying t-shirts and they started loving me. I was, I was sitting community college and this chick you know perfect whatever she was talking to her home girl in the front and she wanted me to pass something to her and she was real like smart like and disrespectful i really didn't want to say nothing i had i had my hat on i took my hat off I had like a, and she was like hey can you pass this up to her you know do I, hey youps um whatever your name is you know afro man and everybody got the sniggling and chicken you know, people started saying that stuff every now and then. but i kept the name Afro Man's ability to not take himself seriously and his overall sense of storytelling through his music to catchy and vibey beats would complete his image. He dropped his debut album My Philosophy around 1999 to an almost extensive flop. I can't wait till I get my welfare check so I can put me a fat sack of yay on deck. He played at parties, on sidewalks, and in contests and simply couldn't find his niche in LA. So he packed himself up and decided to relocate to Hattiesburg, Mississippi in the hopes of finding more success. Once there, he met three musicians that would help him launch his career once and for all. A drummer named Jody Stallone, a keyboardist and bassist named Daryl Havard, and the producer Tim Romanofsky, also known as Headfridge. Hedfridge was the founder of his own label called T-Bones and after stumbling upon Afro Man, he immediately signed him to his label and began production work on his album. The album was titled Because I Got High and featured the titular track. I was gonna clean my room until I got high. <laughs> Ooh. 
at the time it didn't do exceedingly well but it still topped the New Zealand chart and the album was scored 3.5 stars out of 5 by All Music. I recorded it, you know, I wrote it, <laughs> you know, wrote it, recorded it and uh, put it on the CD and I, I sung it. And it's, it was funny, like no matter where I'd sing it, like, like people who you wouldn't think would react would react. You know, I didn't I didn't sung everywhere because I couldn't get a gig nowhere, so I'd play anywhere, you know. And I sometimes I'd be in biker clubs, sometimes I'd be in like I don't know, like punk rock club, whatever. But like any opportunity I had to sing it, I'd sing it and I always had the C D available right after I got through singing it. So I get up there, yeah, I open up for your band, you know, hey, get up there, open up, man. Hurry up. Okay, no problem. Get up there, sing, bam, you know, don't watch it, man. I'd sell all the CDs, man. Make more than the band I opened up for. Following the album release, Afro Man immediately got to work on his sophomore attempt, Sell Your D. This time exclusively produced by himself and dropped through T Bones, as well as his own newly launched label, Hungry Hustler Records. Sell Your D was released barely three months after Because I Got High and featured his other smash success single, Crazy Rap also known as Colt 45. And as a girl, we can take our turn singing them dirty rap songs. Stop and hit the book like Cheech and Chong. Both albums came out around the year 2000 and generated a little bit of buzz for the rapper. While passing out CDs at a party one night, one of his friends grabbed the disc and uploaded it to Napster. Nowadays, it's an online music store, but back then it was an MP3 audio sharing site. Less than 48 hours later, the song Because I Got High was making waves around the world, landing a spot on the Howard Stern Show where it was played to a national audience for the first time and securing it in memory. I went viral before viral was viral. Napster put me in a position to be signed. Universal Records said, this guy's hot and signed me real quick before I got loose. Universal's signing with Afroman was very impressive as six album deal right off the bat. Now I personally think an artist should not sign to a label for that many albums because once an artist signs a deal for that many albums, it becomes very difficult to get out of that situation if things go wrong. His major label debut came in the form of The Good Times Around 2001, containing material from both of his previous two independent releases as well as a few new tracks. The Good Times performed fairly well for a debut. It picked the number 10 on the Billboard 200. And soon after that, the project went gold. The album was preceded by the single Because I Got High, freshly launched into the mainstream. I was gonna clean my room until I got high. <laughs> the song performed well in America, but even better around the world. It topped the charts across the world, including Australia. Germany, Scotland and the UK and earned impressive certifications in multiple countries. The song was actually inspired by true events after a friend of Afferman's came over to smoke. He agreed, stating that he would clean his room afterwards. But then some girls came over and it turned into a party, after which his room looked even worse. This is where the inspiration for one of his biggest hits comes from. I threw the mishaps in there so people wouldn't be on my ass too much. The wrong person might feel like I'm trying to get their kids to smoke and I'm not trying to do that. I was laughing about my own personal experience. Threw the bad stuff in there to kind of move kids away from the gateway drug that might lead them to something worse. But it went with the comedy. I made it all work. It was funny. I got money from both sides, the antis and the pros. November. So anyway, I had all these rap songs. I wrote all of this stuff. And I thought I was KRS-One. I'm like a real MC. I'm talking all of this shit. But I'm not really getting paid. Then I thought, I'm going to just sing a song. And I had been really smoking a lot of And um, I realized that I have all kind of plans. I say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Then I smoke a joint. And I play some music. Next thing you know, the sun's dropping. Girls is coming over. Homies just thought I didn't do none of that shit. I had a great damn day. And then I was not. So even though it took me like two minutes and 11 seconds to write the song, it took me about six months to realize that once I lit up that like I wasn't doing as much as I would like to do. Following the major international success of Because I Got High, the second single of the album was called Crazy Rap. 
This song would go on to be his second most well-known single to date, and although it skipped all of the main charts in the US, it still performed well in many other countries across the world, although it by no means matched the success of Because I Got High. In the meanwhile, his leading single continued to garner success, earning him a Grammy nomination around 2002 and finding a place on the tracklist of multiple movies over the years, including Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, Disturbia, and The Perfect Score. Unfortunately, this would be the highest point in Afroman's career and from there on out, he went on to be just another rapper lost in the scuffle. After a while, he wound up leaving Universal as he did not agree with their future plans for his sound and didn't release much music for a while. I think Universal wanted some more because I got highs, but that's a magical song and I probably can do that twice. At that point, the world was ready to talk about weed and legalization. My song put that topic on the table. Following his departure from Universal, Afroman did not release music for three years. He did a brief stint in comedic acting, landing a role in the direct-to-DVD film Dodge City, a Spaghetto Western. Of course, when he did return to music, it was with a vengeance, dropping four albums around 2004 through his Hungry Hustler records. The first album, Afroholic, The Even Better Times, picked at number 99 on the R&B chart and was soon followed by Job Bells. This was followed by 4020 and The Hungry Hustlers, Starvation is Motivation. Hell yeah, huh, boy, I just seen Big Draws. Big draws. Rolling on D's, getting chased by the laws. After another two-year break, he dropped Drunk and High and another festive parody, A Cult 45 Christmas. By this point, I think Afro Man began to realize that he would never match the success of Because I Got High. No matter how many albums he put out and how many times he tried to shake up his sound and content, he couldn't seem to land another hit. He even began to resent the single that made him famous because it put him in a box that he could not escape. It's almost like the concrete is poured on me and dried. Crowds come out and I gotta sing this and I got to sing that. I'm going to have to come up with some other character so I can do something different. 2008 followed a similar style with Afroman releasing the albums Waiting to Inhale and for Obama, Head of State. Before I hit the party, baby, you know I need what you need, mate. What you need, mate. Afroman continued to perform his old hits but didn't release any new music for several years. Around 2011, he had the whole world chuckling when he got too high and flat out forgot that he had a performance to attend. In the process of getting into the correct vibe, Afroman completely forgot that he had a performance to attend and fell asleep with his hand inside a packet of potato chips. When he woke up, he had completely missed the performance. In the ultimate irony, the club he was supposed to perform at called the Patio Music Club sued him and he was served his papers nine days later. Following the concert situation, Afriman continued to keep his head down and maintained his lock on new music for another two years until around 2013. After this, around this time period, he completely gave up and being anything other than a weed-fueled rap artist. He then dropped on a music and around 2014, he followed it up with The Fro Rider. That same year, he released a remixed version of Because I Got High in order to highlight the usefulness of cannabis. Then around 2015, Afroman made headlines again, but not for good reasons. After walking about half a mile to perform at Mardi Gras in Mississippi, the rapper was irritable and frustrated. This situation was made worse by a male heckler in the audience and needless to say, Afroman was not in the best of moods. That's why when someone approached him from behind while he was performing, he turned around and clocked them so hard in the face that they fell to the floor. The only problem was, it was a woman. After knocking the woman down to the floor, Afroman then continued to perform his songs. Now this situation did not blow over. The clip wound up on NBC News. And soon after this, the internet brought up another incident that happened earlier in the year when he body slammed a man off the stage in a similar circumstance. The man clearly does not like being interrupted when he is performing. Now police then stopped the show and security escorted Afroman off stage where he was arrested. The rapper later paid about $330 bond. He later released a public apology 
admitting that he had been anxious and unmedicated at the time. The woman who was hurt in the incident chose to sue both Afro-Man and the company that owned the venue. On Afro-Man's part, the lawsuit was settled outside of the public eye and he returned to making music. And over the years, I'd be rapping and girls would get up on stage and they was, you know, I want to be like, okay, this chick likes me, she, whatever. But in reality, she's saying, you, it's all about me. You know, it's competing with me. You know what I'm saying? Then you got people that want to do humiliating shit to you and put it all up on YouTube. And then when one group of people see people doing shit to you on YouTube, you get this whole percentage of humanity that starts coming to your show and they want to do it too. And then it becomes this trend. And uh, you got fans, then you got people that aren't fans of you, but they'll come to heckle your act to entertain themselves. Around 2016, the man dropped the album, Happy To Be Alive, followed by 2017's Cold Fro T5 and Two Frig Frags. He then took a bit of a break from music thereafter until COVID hit. This is when Afro Men went crazy as far as music goes. We simply can't list them all. But around this time period, he dropped about 16 projects. Yes, you heard me right. 16 projects on Spotify in one month. Although admittedly, most of them were from his old mixtapes from his years prior. This was followed by another three projects in September of 2016. His sole album release for the year was Save a Cadillac, Ride a Homeboy. And let's just say this project did not do very well and didn't hit any charts. Ding dong of the south, suck my and shut your mouth. That same year, he released another direct DVD movie titled Happily Divorced The Movie. After that, not much was heard from the one hit wonder until around 2022 when he once again made headlines, this time as a victim. Around August, the rapper's home was raided by law enforcement who were apparently on the hunt for narcotics. Afferman shared the whole event on Instagram with clips from his home cameras. Luckily, the police came up empty-handed and the only thing they found was a vape pen, a jar of and a couple of joints. Today, the rapper is still very active in the music industry, his most recent release being the album Lemon Pound Cake and the single Sign My D. He's still very active on social media and you can catch him on Twitter using the handle at OG Afroman where he can be seen with a wide variety of women and their appendages all up in his face. The man doesn't seem to be married, but he has a son whom he often posts on Instagram. Mainly, he can be seen looking like a 90s pimp with big puffy suits all in one extravagant color or pattern and also rocking massive golden rings and chains for some reason. On Spotify, he has almost 3.2 million monthly listeners and he has he's also launched his own marijuana off. brand, Crazy Afro Rap, Man because cannabis. I got high. Overall, I think the reason Afro Man and never made it that big beef. is because he decided to go independent and couldn't follow up his breakout single with something on the same level. That's it for me, it's your boy Ali. What happened to Afro Man in your opinion? Let me know down below. Video requests, be sure to let me know down below as well. Knew what happened to video dropping soon. Also, add me on Instagram to Ali Talks Music. Till next time, peace. Perfect.